Welcome. Back to the Future in Carstone is a CPD presentation for architects from the United Kingdom Carstone Association. This generic presentation aims to provide you with a broad understanding of Carstone, the design context in which it's used, and a sound basis for specifying the material. So, what is Carstone? According to UXA, the United Kingdom Carstone Association, it's any material manufactured with natural aggregates and cementitious binder that is intended to resemble and be used in a similar way to natural stone. Despite its composition, it would be a mistake to think that cast stone has much to do with mass concrete. It's the difference between rough carpentry and the precise handcrafted joinery of a Thomas Chippendale. It's a high-quality facing material, synonymous with reconstructed stone, and it's called cast stone because that's the plainest and most direct way of describing what it is. Cast stone is made by using either the semi-dry method or the wet cast method, which we'll be looking at later, and it must meet the requirements of BS 1217 2008. Carstone has caught the imagination of architects and their clients from the classical past in Britain to the present day. Essentially, it's ideal for any architectural purpose that calls for fine detail at an affordable price. The material has been a familiar and much used alternative to natural stone since Georgian times, and its classical details are used to enhance entrances, openings and gables. In appearance and performance, Carstone stands alongside carved natural stone and normally costs significantly less. It's suitable for period and contemporary styles, stone and reconstructed stone buildings. It complements brickwork and render. It's also used extensively for garden ornaments. As with any building material, it's important you can trust the maker. When it comes to cast stone, UXA is the guardian of quality and represents Britain's leading manufacturers. The association sets high performance standards and members must go through a strict vetting procedure. When you specify cast stone from an UXA member, you can predict precisely its performance as a structural material. Whether design materials are standard or bespoke, they'll be tailored to an exact specification. What's more, UXA members offer the full range of design, technical and sales support services. The origins of the material date back to ancient Rome, with the invention in the 2nd century BC of pozzolana cement and structural concrete, in fact, cast stone is a special form of high-quality concrete. The first formula for high-quality mortar was produced by Roman military architect Vitruvius. It comprised three parts sand to one part lime. The addition of broken pottery and pozzolana, a fine volcanic ash to the mix, gave a strong yet lightweight material that could be moulded in situ, then overclad. Suitable for structural applications, the material was used in Rome to form wide vaulted arches and gateways at the Colosseum and for the Pantheon's famous 50-metre span dome. The first known examples of simulated stone were produced in medieval France. Lintels resembling sandstone were cast from natural aggregates and lime, pozzolan cement in Carcassonne around 1135. The first architecturally significant use of artificial stone in Britain stemmed from the establishment of Code's artificial stone manufactory by Eleanor Code and her family in Lambeth. Code stone was made until 1843. It was used for classical detailing by Robert Adam, John Nash and Sir John Soane. The rediscovery of concrete in the 19th century and the invention of Portland cement which resembled Portland limestone in colour, led to a large number of patented artificial stones. One interesting example is the lion on the south side of Westminster Bridge. Many people assume that it's natural stone, but it's actually cast stone. Meanwhile, the revival of neoclassical forms in the early 20th century aided the use of reconstructed stone 
to emulate natural Portland stone facades. Later in the 20th century, cast stone was increasingly used for structural applications and larger panels with complex reinforcements, as seen here at Terry Farrell's groundbreaking MI6 headquarters at Vauxhall. And postmodernists such as Francis and Quinlan Terry use classical cast stone detailing to relate to an existing context such as brickwork with string courses, pediments, gables and cornices. Compositions have been refined and today's cast stone is far better made with better ingredients than ever before. The material provides an ever closer match to natural stone and a wider range of design possibilities. As we've seen, the manufacturer's aim is to produce a material which resembles natural stone as closely as possible. The colour and texture of most natural stone can be matched using crushed rock finds and or carefully selected and graded natural sands, usually mixed with white cement. The range of shades is sometimes extended by the use of grey cement and pigments. The material can be cast either as an homogeneous mix or a two-part mix, comprising a facing of cast stone and a backing of grey cement and aggregate. In many ways, cast stone is better than its natural counterpart. As well as matching the look and performance of natural stone, it can beat it on strength, moisture penetration, colour and textural consistency. Stratification is never a problem. Cast stone is free from imperfections and it weathers like natural stone. For designers concerned with truth to materials, there's another benefit that distinguishes cast stone. Often, its look is the result of choosing a sandstone or limestone aggregate with the appropriate inherent colour, so the final product can mirror the way natural stones are themselves coloured. And since they are based on centuries-tested details, cast stone details work first time. The material is more readily available than worked natural stone. It generally costs far less, and hand finished after it comes out of the mould, it looks much the same. Cast stone is a highly versatile material. It's suitable for a wide range of projects, styles and applications that call for a fine detail at an affordable price. It's ideal for both new build and refurbishment work, particularly in areas of sensitive planning constraints or where stone is a predominant building material. All types of architectural stonework can be produced, large, small and structurally reinforced. And cast stone's ability to form complex shapes makes it ideal for ornate detailing. In architectural stonework, there are numerous applications for cast stone details, including the enhancement of openings with window surrounds, keystones, heads and sills. And the enhancement of entrances with columns and entablatures, pilasters, porticos and cornices. Meanwhile, cast stone coins, string courses and plinths can turn even the plainest facade into something special. While balustrading, parapet screening, plaques, brackets and corbels can add further interest and distinction to a building from ground level to gable. And cast stone steps Coping, gates, piers, pier caps, spheres and finials provide that all-important finishing touch. For landscaped areas and gardens, cast stone ornaments such as planters, statuary, obelisks, pedestals and even pavilions provide emphasis and accent and a contrast with the planted environment. So do cast stone pool surrounds, fountains from elaborate centrepieces to simple wall fountains and garden furniture. Turning to interiors, cast stone is widely used for door surrounds and chimney pieces, while cast stone ornaments and furniture are seen in public areas from hotel lobbies and restaurants to shopping malls. Because cast stone can be moulded into virtually any shape and size, it can be made to meet precise individual requirements. Custom-made cast stonework is suitable for refurbishment, large section and structural application. It can also take the form of ashlar masonry, 
Modern classicists argue for 18th and 19th century load-bearing construction and structure. These days, natural stone is too expensive for solid masonry. But cast stone ashlar blocks, which can be molded to a natural stone finish if required, are simple and economical to use. These products not only satisfy the truth-to-construction architectural argument, but perform and weather in the same way as natural stone. Now we move on to the wide range of building projects suitable for cast stone architectural details, masonry and ornaments. Cast stone evokes a sense of classical timelessness which fits in with any type of massive construction, from new build to refurbishment and conservation work. Cast stone detailing is suitable for period and contemporary styles of housing, whether finished in stone, brickwork or render. It's also finding a growing market among house builders who want their properties to stand out. There's a simple reason why. Cast stone offers distinction at an affordable price. The material adds to that all-important curb appeal and the overall saleability of a scheme. Ashlar walling with different course heights to create a natural stone effect Banding, porticos and other cast stone details can increase the sale or letting value of new office developments, whether designed to contemporary or traditional styles. And from retail parks and shopping malls to high-end designer boutiques and restaurants, cast stone can enhance both the shop front and the interior. The material fulfills a vital role, both aesthetically and structurally, within the new six-storey library and learning resource at Coventry University. The buff-coloured cast stone was formulated to match the stonework of adjacent buildings. It can also provide the opportunity for cost reductions over natural stone. At this Oxford College building, a natural stone plinth was matched and complemented by cast stone band courses and copings. Used in this modern church, cast stone provides a distinctive original look with bespoke jams, sills and heads. The same detail is repeated internally. And the church extension on the left incorporates custom-made window surrounds, including this impressive Gothic three-light example. Ever since English gardens began to be influenced by those of Italy, planters, fountains and statues have provided emphasis and accent in a garden, drawing the eye in a particular direction. As we've seen, standard or custom-made door surrounds and chimney pieces are available in elegant designs from the simple to the ornate. Interestingly, pieces such as statuary, jardinier, obelisks and garden furniture, which were once considered suitable only for outdoor use, are now regularly used to add interest and atmosphere to interior settings. Cast stone is regularly used for sensitive refurbishment and restoration projects, including the replacement or repair of natural stonework damaged by exposure or neglect. For the refurbishment and redevelopment of the Grade 2 listed building on the left, cast stone elements were produced to match the existing stone type and details. On the brickwork extension next to it, special bay windows with mullions were created to match existing stonework. Moving to the right, for restoring the house in the foreground, cast stonework was made to match the vernacular. And at this college chapel, ornate cast stone pinnacles were commissioned to replace decayed stonework. Now, we turn to how cast stone is made. The production of cast stone can be an elaborate process. It's a handcrafted business, so companies guard their secrets about mixes, additives, moulds and such very closely. There are as many variations in the precise way cast stone manufacturers go about their art as there are master craftsmen. But there are two main manufacturing methods, semi-dry and wet cast. The first is the semi-dry process. This involves the compacting of a semi-dry mix into moulds and releasing the finished product almost immediately. This approach enables repetitive elements to be cast in considerable numbers and quickly. Their surface tends to have an open texture like saw natural stone. The semi-dry process is most suited to traditional sized elements such as sills, heads, 
string courses and copings. Structural items can be produced so long as the reinforcement requirement doesn't inhibit compaction. This ability to reinforce semi-dry cast stone is yet another advantage over natural stone. The second manufacturing method uses the wet cast process, which is similar to casting in plaster. This allows precise rendering of fine detail and, for structural elements, the use of complex reinforcements. It also has a close-grained surface, acid etching, grit blasting, hand or mechanical tooling, and polishing are typical finishing techniques. Let's look at both methods in greater detail. As the name implies, the semi-dry method involves the use of low water content or earth moist mix. The fine aggregates used in the mix are graded so that thorough compaction can be achieved. Computerized batching is typically used to ensure the consistency of materials and measure water content. The mix is then filled into molds. The semi-dry material is then compacted, usually using pneumatic or electric sand rammers. Units are generally cast face down to ensure maximum compaction of the finished surface. After compaction, the units are normally demolded immediately. Sometimes they are hand finished. They are then racked, ready for curing. Turning to the machine molded method, steel hand molding machines are used instead of the usual wooden molds. The benefits are shorter lead times, higher daily capacity, and lower cost. Machine molding can produce consistently sharp, crisp arises, making it suitable for ashlar and details such as L coins and plain band courses. As its name implies, the wet cast process uses considerably more water than the semi-dry process and is generally a through mix of the finished face. The mix design is especially critical to the process and the finish appearance. After the mix is poured into the mould, it is compacted using a vibrating plate or in some cases vacuum casting. The wet cast process generally yields only one cast mould per day. Therefore, architects and their clients should be mindful of the longer lead time required for wet cast stone. And to achieve a consistent stone-like finish in wet cast, there's another factor. A few days after demolding, it requires the removal of a thin crust of cement particles and very fine aggregate particles which rise to the surface. It's called latence. Acid etching is a common technique to remove it, as shown here. As already mentioned, wet cast units are suitable for reinforcement. This is done at the casting stage by the introduction of steel mesh, wire or complex reinforcement cages for units such as balconies. After demolding, semi-dry cast units generally don't require any surface treatment. However, a limited amount of reworking is possible using conventional tools. If you want to replicate a tooled natural stone finish such as striated or rock-faced, the pattern can be reproduced in rubber or epoxy resin and incorporated into the mould. Furthermore, sand and grit blasting exposes to a control degree the underlying aggregate and cement matrix, as shown on the left, while rubbing down a wet cast surface with an abrasive pad following acid etching can achieve an excellent simulation of rubbed limestone. Cast stone can be given a full polish in the same way as for granite and marble, subject to the mix ingredients. Finally, the correct curing of cast stone is essential to resist damage during transportation and construction and for its long-term durability and appearance. The minimum curing time specified in the British standard is 14 days after casting. This period, which may need to be extended for structural units, comprises the crucial initial curing period of 12 to 14 hours away from direct sunlight and drying winds, and then storage before dispatch. However, some Alksa members have invested in vapour curing, a technique which can significantly reduce the timescale required from production to site. In the next section, 
we consider the key technical aspects of cast stone. A key difference between UXA members and other cast stone manufacturers is the high compressive strength of their products, which makes them significantly more robust and durable. In fact, the minimum standard required of UXA members represents a 40% increase in compressive strength over that indicated in the new European standard. UXA's performance test stipulates that the average crushing strength of three cubes tested to BSEN 12390 Part 3 shall not be less than 35 megapascals at 28 days old. No individual cube is to have a strength less than 28 megapascals. Cast stone has low porosity and can surpass the capabilities of natural stone on permeability. It can also weather in a similar fashion to natural stone. Research carried out by the University of Dundee confirmed that semi-dry cast stone weathered in a similar way to natural stone when both samples were exposed to identical atmospheric conditions. On the other hand, wet cast stone tends to retain its supplied appearance for longer. The linear dimensions of individual regular units should conform to tolerances given in this table, although individual UXA members may specify tolerances that are even tighter. The minimum performance standards established by UXA for its members are supported by rigorous testing and quality control regimes, and all new members must go through a strict vetting procedure. The next section focuses on how to specify and use cast stone successfully. It all starts with choosing the right supplier and getting them involved at an early stage to discuss the best solutions. This includes guidance on identifying materials, the preparation of provisional budgets and component details, the technical specification, fixing requirements, a schedule of quantities, and a sample panel or prototype. For peace of mind and to save time and cost, choosing an UXA member is the guarantee of quality. Otherwise, you'll need to check that the supplier manufactures to the British standards and that they carry out cube and cat tests. Check how often and ask to see the results and verification. Does the manufacturer have proper batching and curing facilities? Can you visit their factory? Do they offer CAD detailing? What technical and fixing advice is available? And do they offer after-sales service? To identify the most appropriate cast stone for your project, you'll need to consider which of the two manufacturing processes to choose, the size of units, whether reinforcement and fixing will be called for, and then the aesthetics, colour, texture and finish, including whether you wish to emulate the look of a particular natural stone. Will you be designing for effect, where aesthetics take precedent over cost, or will you be designing for cost within the budget requirement? The chances are you'll be seeking a balance between the two. Cost, structural and aesthetic requirements will determine whether the cast stone is manufactured by the semi-dry or wet cast process. Another factor is how the units should be installed and supported. Where cost isn't the primary concern, the versatility of cast stone comes into its own for instance, individual bespoke units can be made to an exact specification. Shape and size can be as large or as complex as required. Reinforcement will allow the element to have structural properties and fixings can be cast in to the element. Where cost is the primary concern, consider using standard elements and repetition. Also, consider simplifying the detail, reducing the size of the elements and omitting reinforcement if possible. Moving to design and detailing, give consideration to the slenderness ratio, the relationship of length to thickness, to minimise the risk of cracking. The calculation calls for the diameter of either an inscribed or subscribed circle on the section of the product and the length of the product. The slenderness ratio is calculated by dividing the product length 
by the diameter of the circle. The slenderness ratio should be less than or equal to 15. In cavity wall construction, damp proofing measures are essential to control the ingress of rain where the cavity is bridged, also where there is potential for moisture to track across the inner leaf. Detailing for the vulnerable areas around cast iron units is given in UX's technical manual. All projecting components should be detailed with a drip groove to shed water clear of the face of the structure and reduce staining. Lead or copper flashing over cast stone can cause staining. As an alternative, GRP or metal preformed flashings should be used. When designing a cast stone element, it's best to avoid slender projections from the unit as they increase the likelihood of damage on demolding and they don't enhance the unit's appearance or authenticity. Negative rakes, as they present difficulties in mould design. Also, avoid U-sections. They're difficult to mould and are less robust than creating the same effect with jointed components. And avoid mitred joints. Jointed returns are a much more robust solution. Cast stone is often used for structural elements within a building and the inherent strength and density of the material often exceeds requirements by a comfortable margin. The components will be in compression or tension and in some cases both. Units used in compression such as coins, string courses, ashlar and columns are generally not classed as structural units. However, units such as lintels which are subject to forces of compression and tension, should be specified with care and have proper support where necessary. UXA members can provide full detail of the structural characteristics of their products, while the relevant standards provide more general guidance. The movement of cast stone units can generally be overcome by the correct specification of mortar, the use of movement joints and bed joint reinforcement. Also, consider the possible long-term effects of differential movement between different types of building materials. Cast stone can experience long-term shrinkage, whereas clay bricks expand. Details should be designed to ensure that differential movement can take place, for instance, by using a slip plane or smooth DPC to separate materials. In common with any bespoke material for custom-made cast stone, allow yourself plenty of time between detailing the client's drawings to delivery to site. As you can see, it can take several weeks. When specifying standard units, however, the lead times are significantly less, especially for basic items held in stock. Yet another advantage of cast stone over quarried stone is that lifting attachments can be cast into components, helping you to meet the responsibilities of CDM regulations. UXA members can also advise you of the health and safety issues relating to cast stone. To summarise, specification for cast stone should be the relevant standard and consist of compressive strength and permeability requirements, the production method and aesthetic requirements, now we turn to the combination of other factors that will ensure your specification remains failure-free. First, appropriate packaging. Cast stone requires proper protection in transit, and this can range from shrink-wrapped pallets to elaborate packaging for high-value ornate pieces. Most heavy units are delivered in sections for assembly on site. During transit, suitable vehicles should be used and the units covered to protect them from saturation and staining. Palletized deliveries should be unloaded by grab or forklift and the use of slings avoided. Cast stone is heavy. A manual handling assessment should be carried out before the units or pallets are moved. Units should be adequately supported to ensure ease of handling. Where units are supplied with lifting sockets or eyes, they must be used. Safe handling and storage is also vital to ensure the units remain undamaged on site. 
Cast stone is a decorative product, not designed to withstand rough treatment. So reuse interior packaging to protect faces, profiles and arises. Never slide units across each other or stack pallets or large units on top of each other. It's also vital to specify the correct mortar designation to avoid any debonding or cracking. The designation is often different from that used for the surrounding brickwork. Mortars containing lime are recommended for a better bond, increased flexural strength and resistance to rain penetration. Refer to BS 5628 Part 3 or the UXA Technical Manual. Cast stone should only be installed by masons or suitably qualified bricklayers and should be designed to minimize on-site cutting. Typically, units are designed to be fixed with joint sizes of between 5 and 10 millimeters. During construction, it's advisable to protect all cast stonework from staining or adhesion by other construction materials. Also protect installed units from accidental damage by machinery and other trades. Some of the most common reasons for having to replace damaged cast stone on site include stalled sills. To prevent damage from differential settlements, one-piece sills should be laid on top of the damp-proof course with mortar only below the ends or stooling. Window heads. Where heads are non-load bearing, an appropriate structural support should be provided. And porch lintels. Problems can be due to incorrect lifting or incorrect installation, which should be completed as shown in the diagram. Although cast stone elements may get dirty, this is unlikely to cause a problem. Unless the incrustation of dirt is causing decay to the surface or staining the underlying stone. In these cases, some remedial action may be appropriate. The same precautions required for cleaning natural stone should be adopted for cast stone. The phenomenon of efflorescence or cement bloom is temporary and will disappear with time as the result of normal weathering. In many cases, it's possible to mend chip units with mixes very similar to those used in the original product. Cast stone performs well on sustainability issues, both in production and within its life cycles. It's highly durable, non-toxic, reusable, and requires virtually no maintenance or repair. Every UXA member has an environmental management scheme in place, and some are certified to comply with ISO 14001. The environmentally responsible sourcing of materials includes the use of recycled and secondary resources. Some manufacturers are turning to recycled aggregates and others are experimenting with crushed glass. The base materials are essentially the byproducts of industrial processes or are readily available. Although UXA would like to see more cast stone used, the scale of its demands on raw materials will never compete with conventional building materials. Where is the market heading? First of all, cast stone is increasingly accepted as an alternative to natural stone, as it can beat its expensive counterpart on the grounds of aesthetics, performance and availability. Alongside this, People in technical circles argue we are moving in the direction of massive construction simply because the current trend in the building regulation is for increasingly stringent energy conservation. We will, they say, be obliged to move from the current all-glass fashion to an architecture of mass and solidity which lends itself to masonry construction detailed in cast stone. The material is also fulfilling a far greater structural role. Growth in wet cast manufacturing means that larger load-bearing units can be produced, sometimes with complex reinforcement, and ashlar units are also growing in popularity. And the recent arrival of slimline profiles in fibre-reinforced cast stone means that cast stone details will be increasingly retrofitted to existing elevations. Cast stone 
is finding a growing market among house builders and developers. They are turning to Carstone detailing on new build properties to make them stand out. And finally, the gulf is likely to widen further between AXA and non-AXA members over their different standards of manufacture, product quality and customer service. For peace of mind, always specify Carstone from an AXA member. There are around 170 Carstone manufacturers in the UK, most of them small operators without adequate quality assurance and testing regimes. Specify Carstone from this kind of supplier and you could be asking for trouble. AXA sets very high performance standards that ensure the strongest Carstone available, enabling you to predict its structural performance with great accuracy, as well as offering outstanding durability and better site handling. The NHBC says the British standard should be just the starting point. Better still, it says, go for the higher standard adopted by AXA members. What's more, AXA members take service seriously with competent design and technical advice. CAD support, appropriate packaging and reliable delivery often tailored to meet individual building programs. The association's free 28-page technical manual explains how best to use and handle cast stone and provides a sound basis for specifying the material. In summary, specify cast stone to BS 1217 2008. The UXA quality standard ensures the strongest cast stone and many other benefits. Cast stone can be made by either the semi-dry cast or wet cast process. It can beat carved natural stone on performance, aesthetics, availability and cost. Use it wherever you want. Find detail at an affordable price. It's a highly versatile material suitable for a wide range of styles and applications. Your specification for cast stone should comprise the manufacturing process, aesthetic requirements, compressive strength and permeability and the supplier's sample reference. And above all, choose the right supplier, an UXA member. Visit the UXA website for members' contact details to see the latest projects and to download a technical manual or email a specific request for information. Thank you for selecting this presentation. We hope you found